welcome to our visitors this morning to our uh, 3 and 30, which will be offered virtually, obviously, on our Zoom. And um, we are recording today. And we've got John Henry Rice, Dr. John Henry Rice, our curator, uh, giving our talk, the 3 and 30 Visions of Stately India, as you hopefully all can see on screen. Um, John Henry gave the talk on Tuesday in person, is giving it again today on Thursday, and it is being recorded, so everybody is aware of that. And um, you can see it again later on our website if you need to do that um, when the recording is completed and edited. And I guess you'll spend about 20 minutes talking about these pieces, John Henry, and then we have some time at the end. If people have questions, you can add them in the Q&A box and I can uh, read those to you, um, questions or comments. So I'll turn it over to you, John Henry. Oh, the video mic isn't working. Um, Somebody is saying that. Yeah, the. Um, I hope it's not mine. Can it, I hope everyone can hear me. <laughs> but other people's are going to be muted, but I hope everyone can hear me. And and I've just turned on my okay. audio. So. Perfect. Hopefully you folks can hear me. Otherwise, you're just be looking at people. I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, Please type if you, anybody cannot hear uh, John Henry, but thank you. Um, so welcome everyone out there. Uh, today I'd like to introduce you to a small exhibition we've staged in the South Asian in the permanent galleries, um, which presents the Indian paintings collection of longtime VMF, VMFA supporters, Drs. Shantaram and Sunita Talagankar. Um, it will be on view for, let's see, until December 10th. And um, the show includes roughly four dozen works collected by the Talagon cars over the course of nearly 25 years, right up to just a few months ago. Um, Shantaram Talagon car describes his art collecting as driven by a yearning to find connections, both to his own heritage and between the multiple cultures his life has traversed. Equally important to him has been sharing his Indian culture with others. And so it's especially fitting that we're able to make the, um, the Talagankar collection available to so many of VMFA's visitors. The exhibition is presented in two galleries. I'll give you glimpses of there. Um, in a loosely thematic arrangement that privileges content over more typically art historical concerns like style. This allows viewers sometimes to consider pictures created across periods and places related to one another by subject matter. A sort of prelude fills the first of two galleries, which you see there um, at upper left. Um, it, it features the Talagankar's very first paintings acquisition. Uh, this large set of um, of paintings that, that give form to musical modes known as ragas. And I'm not gonna get into these um, any more than to just sort of show them to you uh, because uh, in our next rotation, so um, sometime in de later December, um, raga, raga malas, these sorts of paintings, um, so-called garlands of ragas, um, will be the subject of that next rotation. And most of these paintings from the Talagon cars will remain here in this gallery, uh, while the second gallery is also turned over to exploring this fascinating um, multimedia. Um, so it, it includes not just the visuals, but, but the music and, and um, the poetry uh, describing these varying uh, moods. Um, Anyway, like I said, it's a big subject, and, and certainly there will be a 3 and 30 about that. Um, so this is just to let you know that this, this one gallery uh, is filled with the um, um collection of, of this particular Ragamala set. Uh, the main event then uh, appears in the so-called Pavilion Gallery, um, and... Uh, wrapping uh, around the, its long north and south walls, 
beginning with illustrations of, of well-known narrative texts, um, and then segueing into uh, more devotional religious images. Um, next, um, a few paintings exploring the vagaries of romantic love, and then um, as, as one wraps around this sort of uh, circle, uh, ending with um, historical portraits and genre scenes. And, um, you know, sub-themes do emerge within these loosely organized sections as well as extending between them, um, as do particular areas of strength. Um, the latter include paintings from several of the important polities that rose to prominence as the Mughal Empire's power waned and the British became increasingly embroiled in India's political machinations. When viewed broadly, the Talagankar collection helps us or helps to give shape to this political and artistic landscape of 18th and 19th century India when the subcontinent became increasingly fragmented into rival states. It is this vision of a decentralized courtly India, one that Shantaram remembers as still strongly resonant, resonant during his childhood that inspires the exhibition's title. So that's to make sense of this visions of stately India. I cannot encourage you enough to come see these paintings in person. Um, as you probably know, uh, Indian paintings are rather small scale. Um, so, you know, one could argue you have a certain advantage uh, on a computer screen, but really there's no, there's no substitute for, for seeing um, these and, and nearly any piece of art in person. They're really exquisitely executed. We have magnifying glasses in the galleries uh, to aid one uh, seeing uh, their exquisite details. So please do come, um, as I say, through through early December. Um, Dr. Talagongar is frequently here um, and you might be lucky enough to catch him in the galleries. Um, he, he really passionately enjoys standing in front of his pictures and relating the stories that they tell. Um, and of his, his personal connections to them. He speaks particularly compellingly of the profound effects an encounter with a fine painting can have on the viewer. For him and the lucky listener, um, um, hearing him describe it, beholding a painting can have synesthetic effects. Their visual images eliciting oral, olfactory, gustatory, and tactile responses. And as Shantaram will avidly argue, they can do more than just stimulate sensory pathways. They can transport one back in time. For, Do for Dr. Talagonkar, traditional Indian paintings function as portals, windows into the past, into histories not just to be contemplated, but indeed to be experienced. To hear him describe the worlds on which his paintings open, um, to explain what was happening in those distant times, whether historic or myth or mythic, is is truly a delight. And so, come see these. Hopefully, you'll you'll run into Shantaram, and he um, will uh, delight you in ways that I could only pretend to do. Um, so, with with those preamblings out of the way. Um, in keeping with the program's format, I will highlight three of the show's paintings, a very small uh, sampling indeed of the breadth and quality of the Talagonka collection. I will focus on, um, I'll basically take one from three of the thematic sections that I am earlier mentioned. So um, an illustration from a narrative text, a poetic, a, a poetic examination of romantic love, and a historical portrait. So first, I will start with that painting in the middle. I'll show it to you larger. Um, this is a narrative illustration from, from um, one of the great epics. Um, it's a page from a series of paintings that would have helped illustrate a, a, a long Sanskrit text called the Hari Vamsha, 
which is presented as a supplement to the Mahabharata um, and traces the genealogy of the Hindu god Vishnu, focusing especially on his exploits um, in, in his eighth avatar, Krishna. Um, the painting is attributed uh, to a painter called Purku, um, who really is the most celebrated painter who was practicing at the Punjab Hill State of Kangra. Um, there's been a lot of research into the history of painting in the Punjab Hills. Um, so these are basically uh, small states um, up in the foothills of the Himalayas. So we're talking pretty far Northwest India. Um, and that, that history of painting sort of really locates the, 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 um, the real efflorescence of, of painting in, up in the, in the Punjab Hills in a state called Gulair. Um, and, and, and I'll show you an example, uh, actually a couple examples of Goulart paintings, but, um, the, this famous family of painters from Goulart and, and others, um, are thought to have migrated from Goulart, uh, in the latter part of the 18th century, uh, drawn to, uh, the rival state of Congra, uh, also there up in the hills, um, um drawn by, by patronage. Uh, at Congra. And so, yeah, let me show you. This is useful because um, in the in the galleries, you see, these are actually the first two paintings that you see uh, in the galleries. And the, the painting that's shown smaller here on the left is an example of, of a little bit earlier painting, um, probably from at Goulart, but part of that, that famous uh, family that, that I mentioned. And you can see uh, with with Goulart, later Goulart painting, this sort of um, real refinement and subtlety and delicacy of of the style, and and sort of a real quiet calm um, um, is certainly apparent in this painting. And Congra painting, then the 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 main piece that we're considering, is usually uh, sort of regarded as a continuation of a Goulart style of the Goulart style but one that developed a particular sort of lyrical naturalism uh, featuring more lush and visually dense compositions filled with sort of elegant rhythms and teeming with pictorial details. And that is, is certainly uh, the case with the, with the Purku example uh, that we're looking at here, um, depicting this, this real roiling battle between the forces of, of the wicked king Jarasandha of, of Magadha, these are the forces on, on the right side of the painting, facing off um, against the armies of Mathura, the, 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 the armies of good, led by Krishna's uh, brother Balarama. Um, I wonder if you're able to see my, my cursor, I don't actually know. Um, um, but I would just point out, you know, of course, the density of the composition and and I'll also point out that what we have here is an example, uh, a typical of, of traditional Indian painting of what, of what we call continuous narrative. So you're seeing multiple moments in a story all captured within a single composition. So um, the easiest example of that is Jarasandha, the, the wicked king. You see him, you see he's the largest figure there uh, on the uh, sort of far, middle far right. Um, firing uh, uh, arrows from from his bow, seated on a, on a chariot, which is you know the composition is so dense, it takes a while to pick out the pieces. But he's that largest crowned figure. Um, he, like so many of the others, actually has an inscription on his shield, helping us to identify him. But he appears there, and then he appears again uh, toward the middle of us. Uh, I'm trying to get something out of the way so I can see the painting. Um, um, and of course, I, I really can't. But I know, I know he appears again, sort of upper middle, um, the same, the same figure. And and this is late, you know, the next step in the story where he's facing up against um, um, Balarama, the leader of of these forces, um, and he's actually about to get whacked with a big mace of Balarama's. Um, and and I will also point out below below Balarama, you see uh, firing uh, arrows from his own chariot. This this slightly blue skinned figure 
of of Krishna, um, Balarama's uh, brother. But all all you know, all description you know of, of exactly what's happening aside. I mean, this really is a work of extraordinary execution. Um, it's it's one of the several many real masterpieces, as was that Guler painting that I showed briefly as well. But the real masterpieces in the Talagankar collection, and and it is a great example of of the sort of high point in in the maturation of, of Punjab Hills paintings at Kangra under this this um, well known celebrated painter Purku. So moving on to example or number two. Um, this is is well it's a, it's a it's a change in well it's we're stepping back slightly earlier um but but usefully this this is actually Goulair. so so we're looking at that um you know the, a different genre now we've we've moved from from narrative painting to uh this um the a well established tradition in the indian literary and visual arts of um, really in terms of prominence um, second only to illustrations of the epics were these um, sort of examinations of the theme of love. Um, authors produce treatises on, on the many types of lovers and their different behaviors and temperaments. Poets compiled great cycles of verse likening love's phases to the passages to the passage of the seasons. Writers compared the pursuit of one's beloved to the religious quest for unity with God. Composers crafted musical arrangements to express love's many moods. And of course, artists created paintings to visualize these and myriad other musings on the subject of love. So as I say, this is a, a, a very um, huge part of, of, of the literary and visual arts um, um, and a sort of aesthetic theory uh, in India for, for many centuries. And this is a wonderful example of the delicate, elegant, sensitive, poetic style of Goulair painting in the second half of the 18th century, similar to that other Goulair uh, painting that I showed. And, and like it, another one of the real, real highlights of, of the Talagankar collection. It, it shows a lady on a palatial terrace um, her absent lover symbolized by the peacock. And I, this gives me an excuse to show you another painting in the show, uh, which is also right next to this, uh, to the left of it, when, when you actually are looking uh, at the show. Also showing a lady on, on a, a terrace with a peacock. So similar but different. Um, our main painting that we're considering uh, shows the lady in the flat light of early morning rather than the golden sky of, a, of an expectant evening, like you see on the left, you know, different, um, stylistically very different. You know, this is somewhat later um, and painted down in Rajasthan rather than up in the hills. Um, so so many differences, but but some obvious similarities here as well. Um, back to to our main painting you know she's there in that sort of cool light of morning having waited in vain for her beloved's arrival and she now casts away a string of pearls um, useless adornments um, um, they did not have their effect um, she, and she, with a gesture that sort of seems to spite the bird that symbol of her lover um, there's a sort of as I said, this well-developed um, um, exploration of the theme of love and the different types of lovers and the sort of um, uh, stages of love. Um, but in the classical, this, this sort of most classical Indian taxonomy of lovers, you, you have um, a, a, a sort of classic set of eight, um, describing um, eight different heroines, um, so-called nayikas. And, and these, from two different sets, painting it, painted at two different times, we, they probably would have been from sets showing at least these eight different um, sort of, uh, um, uh, not stereotypical, well, stereotypical, but I was going to use a grander term that I can't think of. But these, these different types of, of lovers. 
And for our um, main painting that we're considering here, um, she is is the, the the Sanskrit term is the the vipra labda nayaka the the heroine who has been deceived, and um, you know having having thought that that her lover was was going to come through the night. Um, but back to its style uh, in particular, this is the real sort of refined um, style of Guler um, and, and its comparatively naturalistic expression of, of painting at Guler is often attributed to that court's prolonged contact with the Mughal court and its painting traditions. Um, and as I say, there's a real sort of delicacy, um, really subtle coloration uh, you see here. Um, and, and the, the detail that, that I like the most gets into that coloration. And it's that there's this one sort of flash of, of a real saturated color. And it's that, that um, red orange stripe uh, uh, above the, the pavilion there. And what that is, that's a rolled up blind, you know, that, that could have been uh, lowered and, and as it is now raised. And what I love about that is that sort of flash of, of strong color draws one's eye to in fact the 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 least um colorful passage of the painting which is the interior of of that pavilion which arguably is maybe even not finished it's sort of sketched in but not finished but i think purposely so um and this is you know at least the way that i see it this is in part part of telling the story which is that 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 was the the love chamber that that lies um, unused. So um, just a, for me, a fun little uh, part of the story there. And now, with uh, five minutes remaining, perhaps um, I will go to the third of our three and thirty. And um, this is a historical painting now and and we step back in time yet a little further and also change place we're now down in rajasthan um this this in fact is also that most recent acquisition of the talagon cars um um purchased just this this spring and so we kind of had to bring it in late and and um get it framed up and have it join the others going up on the walls and it's again another real masterpiece from the collection. Rajasthan is is still in Western India, but but now down out of the hills. Um, Rajasthan literally means the the land of of kings. And so you again have all of these um, rival states um, in Rajasthan quite a bit larger than this than the smaller hill states uh, up in the Punjab Hills. Um, but these the traditions of paintings in Rajasthan and at these courts um, goes back even further than than in the Punjab Hills, and and again a lot of of work has been done on on the painting traditions at these at these various courts, and and one of the bigger and most important ones is the court of of, of the Maywars and at their capital at Udaipur. Um, and this is an example of an early 18th century historical portrait from Udaipur. And the, the, um, the scene that we see here, um, well, I, I should say that the, 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 the main story that I have to tell with this painting uh, gets into the influence of the Mughals, uh, the Mughal emperors, uh, um, basically 16th, 17th into the 18th centuries so of the, the, the great Mughals. Um, who you know were the primary uh, hegemon hegemony of 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 northern and and eventually most of of the the subcontinent um, and their relationships with these um, various uh, princely kingdoms um, scattered throughout India. There's there's um, th this is the, the 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 main sort of art his of of course political. Uh, a history that's being told through this this period, but then also the effects of, of the Mughals and their highly developed um, visual language of of, of power, um, how that uh, is a, 
adopted to varying degrees by the um, so-called Rajput kingdoms, the, the um, largely Hindu uh, kingdoms scattered throughout India. Um, but what you see here is a, a court scene that's happening within a formal garden. Um, um, you see uh, a sort of tent pavilion that's been erected uh, at the center of this garden, um, erected on top of a, a, a marble plat, a, a more permanent sort of marble platform that has been built in the garden, um, and then um, so it, it's it's a tented enclosure, um, but and then has another huge red awning um, to provide even more shade um, uh, above it, and and you have the the um, the ruler. Uh, Maharana Sangram Singh there at the center, the largest figure, and and um, there's sort of a whole uh, uh, hierarchy of 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 how you depict the various court members, and and as you might uh, imagine, the 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 ruler is typically the largest figure. and and um, typically shown at the highest level, um, the 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 you, you can see that he's higher than the, these other figures around him, save for the two attendants um, who who stand taller only because they hold these um, these emblems of of royalty, this regalia above him, um, above the ruler, marking his his importance. All of this is is flowing um, out of the Mughal. Uh, um, you know, sort of language, you know, iconography, language of visual language of, of power. Um, and I will show you some examples uh, of this. Um, well, the, the the whole idea of formal gardens uh, is is primarily brought to India by the Mughals, and and um, sort of conquering uh, of nature and taming of nature. And then building these these pleasure and um, palatial uh, uh, gardens um, within palace complexes, and and I of course have to refer to our marble uh, garden pavilion, you know, which is right there in the same room with you, is is um, a later uh, sort of example of this this. Um, tradition of, of formal garden architecture that, that is brought to India um, by the Mughals and, and um, taken up by, by the various uh, states. Um, what else do I have here? Uh, this, is a, this is a sort of just showing you a little closer of the central grouping here. Um, the Maharana is, is showing favor uh, to so presumably these are the three sons here to the right um, and the heir apparent sort of very familiarly and familiarly, I suppose, um, touching the foot here of, of the ruler on, on his um, sort of low throne. Um, he's being presented by the ruler with, with a very small, it's unclear if it's a jewel uh, or, or a flower, but this is right out of the the the, the Mughal iconography, a, a sign of showing favor. Also, right out of the Mughal iconography, you know, is are the the type of costume that that these figures are wearing, the jama, the the jewelry, the 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 flower or the the um, um, plumed uh, turban ornaments. Um, just it's it's very very Mughal, and I will I will show you a couple pages. From the Pachanama, um, this is a, um, a historical text describing the rule of Shah Jahan, the, the builder of the Taj Mahal, was probably what he's best known for. But these are two pages, um, you know, about a century earlier um, from a, a text now in um, the collection of the, well, I suppose it's the King's collection now, it was the Queen's, but uh, for so long. Um, but showing um, a lot of what you're seeing here. Um, on the right, you see uh, Jahangir uh, presenting the future Shah Jahan uh, with a turban ornament, um, similar to 
how um, Maharana Sangram Singh is is uh, you know, showing favor to his son, and and the one on the left I love so much um, because you know we have this this big awning that that is is you know similar to the one in in the painting that we're considering. Um, I will say though, you know, it's important while while, while um, recognizing all of the borrowings from from the the Mughal painting traditions. Um, this is also very, very Indian, and and I think the the easiest or the the, the most the most um, obvious uh, um, sign of this is is the way that nature is treated here. Um, the formal garden is 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 less formal than than the Mughals would have painted it, and this this sort of ebullient, um, just uh, verdant. Um, um, treatment of 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 the trees and their individual leaves is 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 right out of of pre-mughal uh indian painting traditions here in in rajasthan and and there there are other instances as well but that that is kind of the biggest and most obvious so um i have used my 30 minutes and and i just encourage you again to come and see these paintings in person come see all four dozen of them um, rather than just these few. And, and thank you for letting me talk to you. Um, thank you, um, John Henry. That was really fascinating. It 